I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the Iran hostage deal in which the United States just received five of our American fellow citizens home from Tehran, we have with us Dr. John Alterman, who is our Middle East Program Director, Senior Vice President, and Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy here at CSIS. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Great to be with you again, Andrew. John, I want to ask first, what is the context of this exchange? I think it came out of nowhere for a lot of Americans. For those of us who follow these things, though, this has been cooking for a while. And in fact, there's a lot of people in the community here in Washington who know some of these people. I, I've known Siam Aknamazi for 25 years. Exactly. You know, a third of that time, he's been in Evan prison. This has been bubbling along throughout the Biden administration. Certainly some of the negotiations over getting CMOC back started under the Trump administration. He's been in for eight years. I think there was a sense when people thought that the Biden administration was going to be able to have a return to the the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, that the return of wrongfully detained Americans would be wrapped up in that, you know, maybe sort of as a confidence builder, but it would be part of a process, a process which I think to the Biden administration's surprise never took off. I think they were rightly trying to not rush into things in the last months of the Rouhani government. But when Raisi became president, there was no real consensus to move forward on the nuclear deal. And the Iranians were, were still smarting over the fact that they felt that they had fulfilled the terms of the JCPOA. They never got the economic benefits that they believed they had been promised. Then you have an American president who unilaterally walks away from the JCPOA, which I think nobody had anticipated that the deal wasn't constructed so the Americans could renounce the deal. The the deal was constructed to keep the Iranians. It was Donald Trump who walked away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, this was sort of bubbling along. It was bubbling along for almost two years in the the Biden administration. It ceased to become a sort of confidence builder for the nuclear talks. It became removing a separate irritant. I think the Biden team has been trying to find ways to reduce some tensions with Iran short of having a new agreement. And this is a way to do that. Uh, The Iranian economy is hurting. It gives them access to $6 billion of their money that they can use for food and medicine and agricultural supplies. I think part of what happened was they felt we could really use $6 billion. The economy is hurting. So it's not clear exactly why. I've been hearing that this is getting closer for weeks and it seems to be incremental progress. I'm skeptical just how much it can be. I think we're not going to have a new comprehensive agreement, but we may have some informal understandings between the United States and Iran, both preceding this and coming after this. But it doesn't feel to me like we're moving toward another broad agreement. Okay, so there's a lot I want to ask you, but first I want to just ask you a technical question. Where did the $6 billion, you said it was their money, where did it come from? They sold oil right. to the South Koreans under the terms of U.S. sanctions. The South Koreans said, U.S. says we can't give you the money, so it's sitting in a South Korean bank. The South Koreans transferred it to Switzerland, who transferred it to the Qataris. And there is a mechanism by which the Qataris approve any expenditure of that money as going toward, as I said, those categories of humanitarian supplies, which are exempt from U.S. sanctions under current law. So they now have have the money back. Well, no, they don't have the money. They can draw on the money. The money is in a cuttery bank. It's still in a cuttery bank. It's still in a cuttery okay. bank. And they can draw on the money. It's basically having the cutteries cut checks for them when they decide to move forward with a purchase that is within the parameters set by the United States. So they're trusting us that we won't go back on our word. We're trusting them. We got the hostages back. Well, and they also got five Iranians right. who had been convicted of various things in the West. Some of them went back to Iran. Some of them elected to stay in the United States. So there's a hostage for hostage piece, and then there's a money piece. Okay. So what can we do to disincentivize Iran from taking hostages ever again? And how do we prevent them from doing that? And you know, what do we do if they do do that in the future? It's a hard question, as far as I know. All the people who were freed this week are dual nationals. So they didn't necessarily travel to Iran on a U.S. passport. Iran doesn't recognize dual nationals. So Iran said, these are all Iranian citizens. They're subject to Iranian law in Iran. I'm not sure how many dual nationals live in Iran. 
I think thousands. How many American citizens retain Iranian nationality and have U.S. nationality and may want to travel back to Iran? I think you're going to see a huge effort to discourage Americans from traveling to Iran. Part of this is about ensuring that the Iranians can't easily use the money. Part of it is we have sanctioned a number of people inside Iran who are involved in these detention affairs, including former President Ahmadinejad. I'm not sure how much additional sanctions make a difference. I think from my perspective, a lot of Iranians have gotten used to sanctions. And in fact, a lot of the bad guys in Iran have a financial interest in sustaining sanctions because they make their money circumventing sanctions. To me, your approach has to be an approach of honey and vinegar. The Iranians have to be persuaded. If they do what we want them to do, they will accrue some benefit. There has to be assurance that they behave the right way, they get some benefit. If they behave the wrong way, there will be negative consequences. How you balance those, how you sequence them, I think is tough. We have a lot on our agenda with Iran. It's not going away. The problems are hard and there are proliferation issues, there are regional activities, there are terrorism issues, there are human rights issues in Iran. We had a Masa Amini event last week, treatment of women and minorities in Iran. So it's a complicated set of issues. I don't think we can look at this as, well, if they just do these three things, then we're fine. But at the same time, the idea that you can just keep tightening the screw, tightening the screw, tightening the screw, to me, it ends up reducing Reducing your leverage. There's less you can hold at risk. They've gotten used to it. In fact, a lot of the people in the regime profit from it. They become convinced that this is an existential battle for them. And if they give in, it's a sign of profound weakness that can make everything fall apart. So you absolutely can't give in. And you get to this situation too, where they feel that just surviving is a victory. And if they even just you know, needle us a little bit, then they're showing that they're strong. And I think it gets them to actually misbehave more. We have to keep them in a place where we are moving them along toward more acceptable behavior, keeping the incentives out, assuring that they can see some benefits, giving them a hope that there's another kind of relationship they might have, but an assurance that this kind of behavior is going to leave them with a world of pain. There's a lot to unpack here, John. I mean, you mentioned there's a host of problems that we have with Iran. And it starts with their nuclear program onto terrorism, as you said, their regional activities in Lebanon, et cetera. How do we move them along, as you said, given these realities? That's what diplomacy is about right? Diplomacy fundamentally is about making people do what they otherwise wouldn't do, right? It's not about making people feel good. It's about giving people a series of choices. And I think our diplomacy with Iran has to be giving them choices. You can go through one gate and this is what happens. And you go through another gate and that's what happens. And then you push them through the gate, right? And they can, they can choose which gate they want to do. But I think, you know, one of the challenges we have is it's become very hard for us to imagine a policy toward Iran that isn't just about tightening the screws more and more and more. I'm certainly not of the view that we just have to engage with the Iranian moderates and we empower them and, and you know, all the problems go away. But I do think they have to feel they have a choice and there are consequences of the choices that they make. And their interests are in making more of the choices we want them to make. I think, frankly, President Rouhani was in the right place in that, he said, I don't doubt that the Americans are, are an adversarial power, but the level of their hostility undermines our national security. And we have to find a way to reduce the hostility between the United States and Iran. And I think it was that philosophy that led to the JCPOA. I think the JCPOA was not a perfect document. It was a helpful agreement and that it put some boundaries on what the Iranians can do and gave us some inspection power to ensure they didn't exceed it. Whether President Raisi is willing to do that, I tend to doubt it. I think he is surrounded by people who are more powerful than him, who are very skeptical of U.S. intentions. Again, I think we have to show that we can act either way. But the fact is, is the United States does have a tremendous amount of hostility towards Iran. Not towards its people, of course, but toward the behavior of the government, toward the behavior of the clergy there. How do we mitigate that with finding some ways to get them to go through the doors we want them to go through? Not to mention, it can't be good politics in America to appear soft on Iran. Well, again, that's one of the challenges we have is we've created a situation, certainly in Congress, where we 
tie our hands because anything that looks like a concession to the Iranians seems deeply counterproductive. There's not an easy answer to how you change the Iranian calculus, but I think they have to feel that there is a range of outcomes. They have to feel that there are things they want that they actually can get. And we have to be cautious of not giving away too much to ensure that they comply, to do all the kinds of things that that entails. I think we sometimes underestimate how preoccupied the Iranians are with our power and our wealth. There's a sense I get when I talk to a lot of Americans that they sort of feel the Iranians almost a pure power to the United States or certainly one that can threaten the United States. But their economy is less than the size of the economy of, of the state of Maryland. That's my favorite example. Thank I got you for, that from you. Thank you for remembering that. I mean, that, that puts a lot of it in perspective. It sure does. That here's an oil rich state with 85 million people whose economy is about the size of the state of Maryland. This is a country with difficult infrastructure. It's a country with increasing environmental degradation, drought, things like that. This is a country with real governance problems and a people who are getting fed up with corruption, getting fed up with poor services and all the other things. You know, part of U.S. policy needs to be to think through the fact that this government in this form may not be there forever. And that you, you want to have at least some aspect of your policy thinking about what might come next. Some aspect of your policy has to account for the fact that what comes next may be worse in some regards. But I think, you know, ultimately you have to think about the fact that the Iranians are hurting. The point of sanctions is to change the behavior. So use the fact that they're hurting to change the behavior and to have sanctions that you just layer with more and more and more sanctions and you create a, a sort of political taboo against loosening any of the sanctions, that doesn't get you more compliance. It gets you more defiance because they think there's no way to get anything out of this. So what are some of the things that we can give them? And let's also talk about whatever we give them, this administration, it's a dangerous political time for anyone to seem soft on Iran. So factor that in. And what is it that we can do to move this along that they would respond to? One of the obvious places on issues of sort of medicine, healthcare, those kinds of things and, and getting access. You know, it sounds silly to us, chemotherapy drugs. Right, that actually makes a difference to people. Hard to get medical equipment. There was an effort, I remember 15 years ago, civilian aviation. People can safely fly within the country. I think there are ways you can put some boundaries on that so it doesn't contribute to smuggling arms overseas. I think some environmental issues. I mean, Iran has profound drought. Rivers are running dry. Are there ways to cooperate on some of those issues or to, to loosen up cooperation on some of those issues. You know, I think one of the problems that Americans have is we think that anybody who's adversarial to the United States must be irrational because how could anybody in his, his or her right mind possibly be hostile to the United States? And I think the Iranians are rational and hostile. And okay, I get that. I can work with rational and hostile because you work with the rationality piece and then you work on the hostile piece. So you do think they're rational? I think they are rational and hostile. It's a hell of a combination. It's a hell of a combination, but it gives you tools to work with. So I guess the question becomes, how do we ratchet down the hostility in a responsible way? This particular episode where we got some people back who had been gone a long time, as you mentioned, feels like a victory for the United States, but on their side, they probably feel like it's a bit of a victory too. So how do we build going forward victory, victory without us conceding too much? To me, the, the model, they have access to some funds, but they're highly constrained what they can spend them on, is something worth seeing if we could expand. I'm sure there are some kinds of trade or financing we could allow, if not necessarily support. I think we could think about ways to talk to partners differently about engaging with Iran to give people a sense of confidence of what they can do. You know, one of the things is there's just uncertainty that people have about what we can do with the Iranians. So there are ways that just giving clarity on what wouldn't be a sanctionable activity could represent a benefit to the Iranians. I still remember in the late 90s, you know, the, the Iranians came around and they, they said, well, what you really have to understand is, is how much of this is cultural. And so you should allow Persian rugs and pistachios and dried fruit 
to come into the United States. That would just that would pave the way to all kinds of wonderful things. The fact that Hashmi Rafsanjani was a major pistachio farmer was sort of conveniently left out of that discussion. <laughs> there's some pretty good pistachios, I have to I, say. There's some excellent pistachios. The ones in Dubai, Duty Free, no longer say they are from Iran, but they may still be from Iran. And they're very good pistachios. This is a country with a deep sense of its integration into the region and a deep sense it's been unfairly isolated. And I think there are ways to make them feel less isolated, make them feel they have more at stake. Yeah, I was in Saudi Arabia in July. I was in the UAE last week. There's a lot of fear of Iran in the Arab Gulf, but there's also a willingness, even from people who are just 100 or 200 miles away, let's test this a little bit. Let's explore if there's an alternative. Let's see if they're willing to think strategically about what the energy transition is going to mean for them and how they're going to get by in the world. There's a real willingness among the people who are really most in the Iranian sites to begin to test whether there's a softening, whether there's a potential grounds for cooperation. Again, I think this is going to be a hard problem for many years to come, but can we ratchet down the hostility? Can we find ways to reward positive behavior, not because you want to give them rewards, but because you want to encourage more positive behavior? I think that has to be part of an array of policies, some honey, some vinegar, but ultimately some engagement with the Iranians and some sense as the Gulf is profoundly transforming now, there's at least the possibility that Iran might transform too. And if we can play tentatively, explore a positive role, help others explore a positive role, I think the stakes are acceptable, the rewards are real, and it's at least something we should be exploring. All right, so we're talking about others in the region. One that we didn't mention yet is Israel, of course, and it would go a long way towards building goodwill if Iran stopped threatening the very existence of Israel, which also, we have a lot of people here in the United States who it's very hard to ratchet down their hostility towards Iran based on the threats to Israel, based on terrorism, based on all the history we have with them. How does Israel factor into that? And how do our people here in the United States have just been fed up with Iran and its nefarious activities for so long? How do we deal with that? They've made hostility to Israel, and hostility to the United States, by the way, central to not only their domestic governance, but even more their regional appeal. They've been the government in the Middle East that is siding with the people to be skeptical about Israel's presence in the region, where most of the governments have decided to accommodate themselves to Israel. I don't think this goes away quickly. They are certainly concerned about Israeli intelligence capabilities. I don't think we should make them less concerned about Israeli intelligence capabilities. But at the same time, I think it is useful for Israel Israel to signal that its policy toward Iran is also potentially dynamic, depending on what the Iranians do. There's a, a European role on the nuclear program. There's a regional role in the nuclear program. I don't think Israel is going to be in the front of this. And I would be the first to say Israel has legitimate concerns. They're not Israel's only regional concerns. And I think the Iranians have some sense what would happen if they were to attack Israel and what Israel's capabilities could be. So again, it, it's sort of about right-sizing what's going on, thinking about what you want to do, thinking about what is meant for domestic consumption or regional consumption and what's a description of real intentions. I don't think you can just take the most extreme and say, well, that's the most extreme. We have to be responsible. We have to defend against the most extreme possibility. I think you have to do an assessment. Israeli assessments of Iran's intentions and capabilities are not unified, but in the political realm, I think sometimes they're not identical to where they are in the intelligence and defense realm. Meaning the public perception in Israel of Iran is, you know, Israel's very divided right now, as everybody knows, but united on the Iran issue. So that's something it's to It's a big unifier. Absolutely. John, this is fascinating as always, a lot for us to think about. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about Iran in the very near future in one way or another. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 